Okay, we are on part three of the formed elements. That would be the thrombocytes or the platelets. And in your packet of notes, we would be starting on page 36. Okay, here we go. Thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are also called platelets. So platelets are really just fragments of cells. You can see in the picture here, they're very tiny. They're less than half the size of a normal red blood cell. They're fragments of cells called megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes are these big, giant cells found in the bone marrow. This particular one is found in the blood, which is not a good sign. It's usually a sign of leukemia if you see a megakaryocyte in the bloodstream. But you can see from this big megakaryocyte, there are the platelets coming off of it. About 2,000 platelets are formed from each megakaryocyte. The lifespan of a platelet is about 5 to 10 days before it's destroyed by the liver. Function of platelets, they are essential to blood clotting and they jump into action when a blood vessel is injured. Hemostasis is another name for blood clotting. And in the blood clotting process, there are over 30 steps using 13 clotting factors. This is called a cascade because one thing happens and then the other thing has, happens and everything depends on the one before it. So this is a pretty busy time when your blood needs to clot. Blood clotting occurs any time a, a blood vessel is damaged, even a tiny, tiny damage up to a big, large gushing damage. It's pretty fast. It occurs in about three to six minutes. The blood will be clotted if you have all of the normal clotting factors available. And what the clot does is seal the blood vessel until the blood vessel can heal itself. Required elements, uh, platelets, of course. Some proteins, prothrombin and fibrinogen. Calcium, so you need minerals present. You need vitamins. Vitamin K is very important. These are made by the liver, most of these factors. You need clotting factors like factor eight. Prothrombin activator is another example. And you need to have healthy liver function to make all of these different clotting factors. Stop the video and go to Schoology to find and complete the hemostasis activity. Check your answers while you're there and then return back and we'll continue on with the lecture. For the clotting process of hemostasis, there are three key events that occur all the moment that a blood vessel is damaged. And they are vasoconstriction, platelet plug formation, and the coagulation or clotting of the blood. Vasoconstriction is just a vascular spasm. This happens really quickly, briefly. The blood vessel, uh, muscles around the blood vessel contract. Our three steps again, vasoconstriction, platelet plug formation, and then the steps of the coagulation cascade. So when platelets are circulating in the blood, they come into contact with an injured blood vessel. This is an injured epithelium part of the blood vessel. This causes them to become activated. They're going to change their shape from round and to spiny, and they become sticky. They stick to the broken vessel wall, and they start to stick to each other as well. And from this, they form the plug uh, to plug the break in the blood vessel. They also start to interact with other blood proteins to form fibrin. Fibrin strands are that net of material that entraps platelets and blood cells and produces the blood clot. Each step in this cascade relies on the one before it to happen, and it goes on and on and on. The bottom line, you get fibrin, you get red blood cells and platelets, and you'll have a blood clot forming, which will allow the blood vessel to heal. How would the clot get removed? Well, over time, enzymes will dissolve and break down the fibrin, and then the clot will start to dissolve. Ouch! Here's how platelets form clots. This small artery has a cut. Blood flowing past the cut includes red blood cells that carry oxygen, platelets that come from white blood cell fragments, and clotting factors that help blood clot. When a blood vessel is damaged, blood cells and plasma 
ooze into the surrounding tissue. Platelets immediately stick to the edges of the cut and release chemicals that attract more platelet. Eventually, a platelet plug is formed and the outside bleeding stops. On the inside, clotting factors cause a cascade of activity that includes strands of blood-borne material called fibrin sticking together to seal the inside of the wound. Eventually, the blood vessel heals, and several days later, the blood clot dissolves. Let's do some stop and think questions. Alex has been bruising very easily lately. What does bruising indicate? When you see a bruise on your skin, that's because blood has leaked out of a blood vessel into your surrounding tissue. Now your clotting process has probably taken over and stopped the leakage, but you still have a little uh, blood, some blood cells that are sitting around in your tissue. And you notice that in a bruise, the color starts out very dark, purple or black, and it eventually will change to yellow and then it will go away. So that is just the hemoglobin being broken down over time. Why would the doctor want to check Alex's platelet levels if he's had a lot of bruising? Frequent bruising could indicate the inability for your blood to clot efficiently. That means you're having a lot of leakages out of your blood vessels, and this could be caused by low platelet levels. So the doctor would want to check that. Marie has cirrhosis of the liver. This means her liver is damaged and there's a lot of dead cells in the liver. Why would there be a concern that she would have problems with excess bleeding if she were to get cut? So we just talked about this. The liver is producing all of these clotting factors that are needed for the coagulation process. Example, prothrombin and fibrinogen. So if your liver is damaged, you're not going to be able to produce the um, clotting factors that your body needs. Disease connection. So there are some disorders of clotting. Clotting is a good thing. We need it to happen all the time, um, but it can also be negative for us. A thrombus is a blood clot that forms in an unbroken vessel. So this is not a normal clotting procedure. You suddenly have this blood clot forming in the middle of a perfectly normal blood vessel. A large thrombus can even block blood flow and cause tissue death. Another vocab word is an embolus. An embolus is a blood clot that forms and then it breaks away and starts floating in your blood vessels. An embolus, the problem with that is it's going to eventually become lodged in a capillary or a vein or an artery. And when this happens, it will block the blood flow. And at this point, it's called an embolism. Let's look at some consequences of embolism. We can have a cerebral embolism in the brain. This is commonly called a stroke. Coronary thrombosis is in the heart and this is a heart attack. Pulmonary embolism occurs in the lungs. Pul pulmono is the prefix for lung. And DVT, deep vein thrombosis, occurs in the deep leg veins. There's a treatment for a thrombus and People go on this medication and they can stay on it for life if they need to, if they have a tendency for clots or thrombus. These are blood thinners, anticoagulants. Three major ones that you need to know about. Aspirin blocks platelet activation. So that's uh, the effect of aspirin is to block your platelets from becoming sticky. If they can't become sticky, they can't stick together to initiate that clot. Warfarin, also known as Coumadin, blocks production of clotting factors, specifically vitamin K. So if you don't make vitamin K, you're not able to clot your blood. Heparin reduces coagulation by preventing conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. So it again stops the clotting cascade. Also there's genetic disorders and a big one is hemophilia that interfere with the clotting process. Someone with hemophilia does not make factor eight. They have a mutation in their DNA, they're not able to make factor eight for clotting. And so they have to be given factor eight their whole lives as an injection or, um, or they would bleed to death.
blood tests that are helpful in diagnosing blood disorders. We're going to talk a little bit about this. And the main one is called the CBC, the complete blood count. When your doctor orders the CBC, it comes in three parts. Um, there's the red blood cell component, which includes the count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and MCV, which is size of your red cells. There's the white blood cell component, which is the white blood cell count and differential, looking at the different types of white cells that are in your blood. And then there's the platelet count. If your red blood cells are very low, significance of that could be anemia or a hemorrhage somewhere in your body. For example, if you have a bleeding ulcer, your red blood cells would be very low. If your red blood cells are high, this could indicate you are dehydrated. If your white blood cells are high, this could indicate an infection, either acute or, or chronic, long-lasting infection, or it could indicate a cancer like leukemia. If your platelets are high, this indicates that you have a very high risk of blood clot. Too many platelets, too crowded, and there's a high chance they'll become sticky and create blood clots. If your platelets are too low, this could be an indication that, for one thing, you're going to be bleeding everywhere in your body. If your platelets are too low, your clotting process can't happen. Sometimes you need to receive blood for whatever reason. Um, and receiving blood, it's very important that you know your blood type and that you get the correct blood type. So when you go into the hospital, they will automatically give you a, a, a test your blood to see what blood type you are. Blood types in humans are A, type A, type B, type AB, or type O. So you're one of those types of blood. We all have the different blood types. The difference in the blood types is caused by different proteins called antigens found on the surface of the red cells. So type A blood have A antigens on their red cell surface. Type B blood have B antigens on the surface of the red blood cells. If you are type AB, you have both A and B antigens on the surface, and if you're type O, you have no antigens on the surface of your red blood cells. Why, do this, why does this matter? Well, if you have a blood transfusion and you get the wrong blood type, you can have a transfusion reaction. This is when you will have agglutination or clotting in your body, and it, you, it will start out and then every organ system you have will start to form clots and this can become fatal very, very fast. Just two vocab words here. An antigen is a substance that can trigger the production of antibodies. Antigens are located on the cell surfaces. Antibodies are circulating in your bloodstream produced by the immune system and the job of antibodies is to destroy foreign substances. Complete the table in your notes. Blood type O have no antigens on the surface, and so that means people with type O blood have A and B antibodies circulating in their bloodstream. Type A have A antigens, and so they will have B antibodies in their bloodstream. Type B blood have B antigens on the red cell surface, and they have A antibodies circulating. Type AB blood has A and B antigens and no antibodies circulating in their bloodstream. So what does this mean for transfusions? This means that type O blood are the universal donors. Type O blood is the most common blood type, and anyone with type O blood can give their blood to anyone else. Type AB is the most rare blood type, but type AB is known as the universal recipient. So anyone with type AB blood can receive blood from any of the other blood types. There's one more factor on your red cells that makes a difference with transfusions, and this is called the RH factor. You are either RH positive or negative. You either have that factor on your red blood cells or you don't. An RH negative person may form RH positive antibodies if he or she has been exposed to the RH antigen either during a transfusion or even more common is um, during pregnancy than giving birth. So let's take a look at that scenario. If the mother is RH negative and her baby is RH positive, 
everything is fine until the mother and the baby's blood comes together, which um, can happen before, but usually happens at birth. And when this happens, the mother's body sees that positive antigen and starts to make antibodies against it. So the first baby, no problem. The baby's born, but in the meantime, the mother's body is making these antibodies against RH. So when a second baby comes along that is RH positive, if, if, it, if it is RH positive, the mother's body has already made these antibodies, which will attack the baby's blood right before birth and during birth and after birth, and the um, will start to kill the red blood cells in the baby. And this is called hemolytic disease of the newborn, HDN. Effects on the fetus. If the fetus has hemolytic disease of the newborn, the red blood cells are being destroyed. So the fetus will have anemia. It will have pale looking skin. Um, it will have yellow coloring in the umbilical cord and the whites of the eyes and on the skin. This is called jaundice. It may not start right at birth, but it's going to continue developing as the um, as the mother's cells that are in the baby start to kill off the baby's red blood cells. Um, also may have an enlarged liver and spleen and severe swelling. Prevention of hemolytic disease of the newborn is that now the doctors are aware if the mother is RH negative, the doctors are aware that that, that mother needs to get shots called Rogam shots. And when this happens, it suppresses the mom's immune system so that the mom's immune system won't make the RH antibodies and won't attack the baby's blood. 85% of people have RH on their red blood cells. So they are considered RH positive. So we're gonna do a little bit more with transfusions. Anyone that's RH positive can receive either or plus or minus blood. So O positive can receive either O positive or O negative blood, doesn't matter. But 15% of people do not have RH present on their red blood cells and they're considered RH negative. They can only receive RH negative blood or they can have a transfusion reaction. So we can get a little more specific with our universal donors and receptors. Universal blood donor would be O, like we said, but it's O negative. It's definitely the universal blood donor. And the universal recipient is AB positive. 